I have just rolled up here at Iron Root Republic in Denison, Texas. And I have to tell you, when it comes to bourbon distilleries, these guys are the real deal. Iron Root Republic have built a business around distilling Texas corn with French brandy techniques. The result is a group of amazing people and even better whiskey. If you're anywhere near Denison, you really need to take the time to drop into the distillery, sample a few beverages, and buy a bottle straight from the source. Otherwise, check your local retailers, but you really do need to experience Iron Root whiskey. There is another aspect of the Iron Root family that's perhaps even more important for us today. They are remarkably open and willing to share their knowledge. And I have Jonathan here, who is the head distiller, to show off one of those bourbons, which is... Iron Root Harbinger. Awesome. And this one, a pretty awesome award in 2020. It did. So this one, World Whiskey Awards, uh, best uh, bourbon in the world that year. So it was the first time that some juice that hadn't come from Kentucky uh, actually won that award. So we're pretty proud of that guy. Pretty freaking special. And today, you're going to help us. I'm going to show you how to make the base for it. Awesome. So when you're mashing corn on a Proper scale. <laughs> Proper. Yeah, you use this guy here, right? Right, that's a, about a 500 gallon mash tank. Uh, so about 2000 liters. And so uh, this, we'll use this guy for to mash everything that we make here. And the reason we're not gonna show you guys how to do it on this is because it just disappears in there and you can't see anything. We generally use about 400 gallons of water mm -hmm. um, in there. And we'll actually heat that up to about 60 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so, that's when we'll actually go grain in with it. And we go, go grain in, we have a fairly fine grist to it. It's not quite flour, but almost. And we'll go directly in. We're going to mash on grain, from a, on grain, distill on grain. So there's no louder in the bottom of this guy. Okay, and so awesome. what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the, an agitator, some steam, and we're gonna just go ahead and cook that corn. Uh, if we're gonna do 100% corn mash, we gotta use some enzymes. Yep. Uh, and so we'll use the enzymes. Uh, we put some in before, when we go grain in, before the boil and after. And then we'll actually add a, a third enzyme um, once we get it cooled back down before we pitch yeast. But that's hard for me to replicate at home on my little system. So maybe we should jump over to a tiny system here. Like a one gallon-ish system? Yeah, 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 perfect. We, we can do that. We're gonna use uh, 2.6 pounds of this today, but this is gonna okay. be mostly yellow dent corn. Mm -hmm. locally grown, locally uh, sourced for us. And then we also are gonna use some bloody butcher corn locally grown as well. Okay. Bloody butcher corn is gonna be about 35% of that. And so they're gonna be 100% corn mash build today. Awesome. And that's how we're gonna get those good flavors from the bloody butcher corn that we're gonna put into Harbinger, which it's known for. So some of those sweeter kind of red fruit notes that are in it, that okay. specifically comes out of that bloody butcher. Uh, so uh, ratio of corn to water, what's roughly you, what you end? Usually we're about, uh, three pounds to one gallon is what we're gonna end up doing. So, but today I'm gonna talk in terms of pounds so it's easy for everybody. So <laughs> yeah. 2.6 pounds of grist, and we're gonna go to a, in total seven and a half pounds of water. All right, so in the pot now, we've got six and a half pounds of water. We started out with RO water, which is reverse osmosis, which is about as pure as water as we can get. We have the ability to get that here on site, which is great. Um, you may not be able to get that where you're at, um, but one of the, the downfalls to RO water is it doesn't have some of the natural salts and nutrients that you would need for fermentation. Uh, so on the second addition of water, when we put in the other pound, we're gonna put in just filtered water from here. Now, Denison has extremely high, what we call TDS, which is total dissolved solids, especially during the summer. So. Uh, I think that it helps, gives us a house style for our whiskey. A lot of the kind of salt uh, flavor are mashed that way. Um, but in this case, if we just use just that water right now and not the RO, it would be so strong fermentation is gonna take, you know, three, four weeks before it'll finish up. So for the, the people at home, they're gonna have a giant range of different water types that each individual is dealing with. What's kind of the range, like, how would you tell someone whether to decide to just use their tap water or try and doctor it in some way? So tap water, if you just untreated tap water may be an issue for you. So mm -hmm. usually a lot of municipalities will use chlorine in there. You may have a lot of iron, things that are not necessarily going to be good for fermentation or for flavor in the final product. 
Um, so that's why a lot of the brewers out there will actually go from RO and then just kind of chemically treat the water with salts to specifically with each beer. Um, you can do that in the distilling world. Um, I kind of like the terroir of our water. And I know because our water actually comes from the Red River into our local lakes, and that's where the city pulls it from. So it is actually a taste of North Texas from that standpoint. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this is an interesting topic actually, and I've, I see arguments on both sides of it. Terroir and water going into the mash and being distilled, mm -hmm. do you think that has any effect after it's distilled? Or is it mostly on the proofing side that well, that comes in? This is a, yeah, this is a big topic, right? So yeah, terroir yeah. and whiskey in general, um, but terroir and water, so there is probably some effect from the water you use. Yeah. Kentucky's talked about this from a long, for a long time, even though a lot of them, when they're proofing, will RO their water, the oh, limestone okay, water. Right. Yeah. Um, so there is probably an effect when on the mashing side. Can we prove it? Probably not. There's right. way too many variables. Yeah. So it's just another one of these things in whiskey where... It's the magic. Up. So you can do some things to the water. If you just want to use your, your local water, you can carbon filter that. Okay. That'll take out a lot of anything that's, uh, it, so it's, we have water that comes from lakes up here. Sometimes during certain parts of the year, you can actually taste lake water right. vibe in there. Carbon filtration will usually take that out. And what are the, what's the range of where you would say it's acceptable and it's probably easier just to, to use? So, some of the brewing uh, manuals and that'll say like 200 parts per million or less or yeah. 80 would be beneficial. It really depends on the flavor profile you want to achieve and the style of whiskey you're going to make as to how much kind of that, those extra salts in the water you're gonna need. So I shot this video with Iron Root perhaps six, eight weeks ago. Uh, I had no idea who or if there was gonna be a sponsor for this video, but went into the AM, got in touch with me and said, Jesse, we've got a dirty great big Cyber Monday sale going on. Uh, could we sponsor a video? I didn't even have to think about it. I knew I'd be wearing Into the AM shirts because I just love them. They make these dope shirts. Get the beard out of the way, Jesse. Uh, with very cool graphics on them. I hear you saying, what about the black shirt, Jesse? It's an Into the AM shirt as well. I love these things. Comfy, awesome designs if you go for the designs. Insanely hard, long wearing, and they're just comfortable. They're just nice to wear. There is, of course, the collaboration shirt between Chase the Craft and Into the AM as well. And little birdie tells me that there's a new one coming sometime soon. So keep your eyes open for that. But if you've been thinking about getting some stuff from Into the AM, and now is the time to do it because they have an awesome sale on right now. Use the code in the description down below and that'll give you an extra 10% off the already awesome discounts. So happy shopping team. So we're at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius on this guy, which means we're, we're gonna go grain in on this now. I like to go in a, not quite as, as high a temperature because it prevents things from clumping as, as easily. Um, and also in this hand, I've got our first enzyme we're gonna add in. That's gonna help it not get so thick and stick to the bottom and burn, especially when we're gonna be mixing it by hand today. So this is an alpha amylase. Uh, amylase is the same thing that's in your saliva. It's gonna start breaking down all this corn right out the gate. And so it'll liquefy it as soon as it hits the water. So we're gonna go ahead and just put in a little bit of the corn and get it that kind of mixed in. This is a pretty high grain to water ratio. So it's gonna get pretty thick in here, even with the enzyme. Um, so we wanna make sure that that corn is going into solution as we're, as we're going in here, since we don't have an agitator like we do on our big tank right behind me. So I also have to imagine that if you're doing a one gallon batch that a, uh, a mash paddle of this size is 100% necessary. Uh, you definitely have to have this size. <laughs> this is. This is for the finesse of the mixing here. This is <laughs> so. This at the moment is basically the consistency of a almost like a coffee or a really like a thin, thick shake or something. If you hadn't have put those enzymes in, this would be dough in the bottom, and I would be paddling furiously. <laughs> yes. All right, so we are almost up to a boil. I'm going to add what we call anti foam. If you don't have anti-foam at home, that's cool. If you have a little bit of corn oil, it'll do the same thing. It's just gonna change the surface tension on this. And basically what it's gonna do, is it's gonna make it so it won't foam up on us. In a pot this size, probably not a problem, but just to be safe, we're gonna do it anyway. So, we're up to a simmer now. Uh, is the plan to keep this gently simmering and stir it every now and again? 
We want to keep it just at that kind of boiling point. Right. So, so we're, we're going to have to gel the corn. There's different numbers as to what temperature you should gelatinize corn at. The most efficient thing we've found is to actually just boil it for 40 minutes. Okay. And then you, you're safe. G yeah. You don't have to even worry about it. If, if it doesn't gel at that point, it's not going to. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So uh, a little stir every now and again. Keep the lid on. Yeah. 40 minutes. Uh, and at this point, we've denatured those enzymes that we put in earlier, right? Correct. So they were, they were just there for logistical purposes in terms of ease of stirring? Yes. But we have to put more in later. We're going to come back and, and do a second one after we get it cooled down a little bit so we don't denature them again. All right, so we're done with the cook. Now we want to crash cool this as fast as we can. We're going to do that with an ice bath over here. So we're just going to simply just move them in. We're going to be able to add in uh, enzyme again. We also have our other set of water we're going to add. This is just Denison City water that's been carbon filtered. So it's got some of those nutrients in there that we're going to want. And so we're going to go ahead and add that in. Stir that guy up. And then we have our last little bit of enzyme here that we're going to add in. This is that am, uh, alpha amylase. We're going to add that again. This is the second edition of it. We're going to put that in. So we're down to... <laughs> Yeah, go. No, don't go. Yeah, get excited. Yeah. <laughs> Down to 21 degrees Celsius. Time to get out of the ice bath before it gets too cold. Yeah, no, we don't want to get it too cold. Okay. Yeah. You, you grab that one. I'll grab this bad boy. All right. There we go. Uh, so, so what's the plan now, man? Now we're going to add a, the second, well, it's the third edition of enzyme, but the second actual enzyme we're going to add to. Right. So it's the, the gluconase. So the alpha amylase is breaking super long chain stuff down into much shorter chain stuff, but some of that is still too complex Correct. for the yeast to get after. And the gluco is going to chop that down even smaller to yep. really simple sugars. So we're going to get maximum yield out of it by doing it this way. Filling that dry. Yep. And then we're going to mix that for a second, and then we're going to go ahead and add our yeast directly to this. If you wanted to do a, uh, where you rehydrate the yeast, you can do that. You can pitch it directly into here. Um, what we're gonna do today is just pitch directly. So it's gonna be about a teaspoon of, of M1 yeast that we're gonna put in there. So I have never seen nutrients in tablet form before. Yeah, these are like time release tablets. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. Obviously, I'm guessing we don't need a whole one of these for this size batch? Yeah, we, we use about 12 of each of these for a 500 gallon batch. So okay. we're, we're just going to scrape it with a knife and put a little <laughs> bit of the, the, the magic sprinkling. fairy dust yeah. in there. So for people at home, uh, I'm guessing that they're not going to get the same tablets as used probably. Probably not. But is it is it mostly just free amino? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Is, after. Yeah. yeah, so te technically dead yeast cells, correct? Right. So if you've so got uh, old yeast, you can boil it and explode the cell wall and stuff, blah, 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 or any of the plethora of products that you can find at a, right. a home brew store will probably do it right. Right, we're not gonna call this a sour mash. Technically right. with this, you could say it is. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. So, but. All right, so now we're done. We're just gonna put this into the, the small scarborough we have here. <laughs> and then we're gonna set it up for fermentation. And then hopefully after you know, a good five days, It'll ferment it cleanly, and we'll be uh, ready to, to, to our, do our first distillation on it. How clean is that pot looking? I can't see it from there. Uh, you got just a little bit left. Perfect. This has been fermenting for uh, four, five days? About five days. Feels like forever. We've been at the boss's ball. It will take it out of you. That will. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it started at about 1086 from memory and it's fermented out clean, dry, whatever you want to call it. Uh, time to distill it. But uh, we're using a wee tiny still and very tiny still. And you're thinking it's probably not going to handle distilling on grain. Yeah, it doesn't really have an agitator attached. It's not really something we can swirl around right. very easily or even agitate inside. So I think it's best if we go to liquid. If you have the equipment to distill on grain, it's just going to be better in every way, shape, and form. Right? That would be preferred if you could do it that way. It's going to be a lot easier, and it's probably going to get a better tasting product, right? I like the mouthfeel you get when you taste on grain. All 
I'm conveniently leaving uh, Jonathan to do all the hard work here. But uh, for those of you at home that are doing this maybe on a, a slightly larger scale, a few other tips and things that you may find useful. Uh, number one, if you're real down and dirty, you can literally use uh, pillow covers. I've seen people do that and it works wonderfully. Uh, cheesecloth, muslin, also great. A kind of interesting tip, I've seen people use those mop buckets that you stand on and squeeze. So you put it all into like a pillowcase. Oh wow, And okay. then squeeze it with that. Uh, and I've had excellent results with a fruit press, like a brandy grape, same thing. Fill, fill a bio bag up with this stuff, use the press to press it down. Having a Jonathan works wonderful too. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever actually used this still. So this we're gonna decoration. find out. It's bar decoration. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. And we're kind of questioning how sealed this is. Uh, so we have some, what are you calling it? We call it moonshiner biscuits oh, in right. the US. Yeah, I, I'm boring. I've just always called it flour paste. There's no sexy way to do this. No, there's <laughs> not. We collected feints throughout the stripping run at pretty much the same speed. No fancy control of the still, no cuts, nothing like that. Just collecting spirit for the spirit run. We finished the stripping run distillation and we ended up with this as a grand total. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, it, it, it actually tastes really clean for a, like a first distillation, a pot still. Sitting more on the pretty kind of red berry, yeah, I like it. Red berry, mm. uh, it's not fainty at all. Mm. Why isn't it fainty? That's a good question. Um, I mean, it is, but not nearly as much as I would have thought for this. Right. So some of that we're off grain on it, so we don't have all that other stuff going mm. on. We uh, we fermented in a giant container, so Huge we're heat space. yeah, so we weren't encouraging it to have a lot of pressure on it and make some more of those those kind of fusilli notes. Right. Um, and as far as scale, when we start fermenting in our fermenters, they get hot, really True. hot, because we're, we're doing 500 gallons at a time. And this probably wouldn't have, maybe like a degree or two past room temperature. Right. But uh, this is this is your production low weights, is that correct? Correct. Can I taste that? Yeah, go ahead. This is. <laughs> I think it's pretty similar. Okay. They've both got the, they've both got the, the berry thing. Yeah. Uh, this is, like we said, slightly cleaner, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, so as far as barrel aging, yes. I like it a little dirtier. Yeah, I could feel that. However, this is just something to uh, probably go into, something you're gonna just make and then taste as a clear spirit, would be beautiful like this. I think the fruit's gonna pop. You don't have the faintiness to deal with. So I think going into a spirit run, that'd be great, uh, depending on what you wanna do with it. That is what one gallon gets you, and if you're going to distill it again, you may get all of like two glasses of whiskey out of it. Yeah. But I wanted, I, I thought it would be funny to see what happened making you distill one gallon. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do now is uh, pop this back into the still along with um, another two stripping runs worth of production low wines. So essentially, what we're doing is distilling uh, like we made a three gallon wash. Three stripping runs, one spirit run. Right. And then we'll uh, we'll see what we get out of it. Sounds good. Yeah? All right. Yeah. Uh, I guess we need to pop this off, right? Yeah, we gotta take off our moonshiner biscuits in order to get in there. Ah, oh, then we gotta put more on again. Yes. <laughs> Should I just pull? I just like, oh, wow. That's perfect, yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. Okay. You wanna tip that in? Yeah. Oh, we gotta empty it out, you muppet. <laughs> All right, so we ran out the spirit run. This is like one of your base, like main production recipes, so you know it really well. Yep. Do you want to walk us through the cuts that we've made? So this over here in the plastic, this guy is four shots. We don't really taste that. So that's, we just collect, kind of give it a mouth. There's probably a touch of heads in here. Usually okay. when I do it, I'm a little bit more, um, We'll say conservative on that cut because it conservative as in there's no take reason more yeah take more of it there's no reason for me to you're not going to keep this anyway yeah. so yeah so, four mm. shots be gone mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all 
All right, so our next cut was going into heads. <clears throat> and so, so we've got heads and uh, basically some of the factors we're looking at going into our hearts. Uh, there's certain uh, kind of indicators flavors wise to me. There's certain proofs that we'll try and hit. Um, on a production scale, we know how many liters of heads we're collecting. So there's a lot of things we can use to determine how we're gonna make our cuts. And I'll use everything at my disposal. Every time. Every time. Right. Um, and there's there's a technique called demisting, um, which is kind of a cool thing. If you load the still in a very specific way at a certain percentage and you're, you're running it uh, on a pot still, um, you can actually do a technique where you add water to it very quickly and uh, quite a bit of water compared to what you have in your glass uh -huh. and it will cloud in the glass. Uh -huh. And as long as it's still clouding, you know there's part, there are heads in there. Ours will actually do it here, so I do okay. use that typically. Um, this one was not demisting for us, and I think it's because there's a little more reflux in that little tiny uh, copper okay. pot than yeah. we typically have. There's uh, some layers in there. Right. Um, so, but in, in this case, uh, some of the flavors I'm looking for, there's kind of a wet cardboardy thing. Um, it's probably more of a personal flavor to me. There's uh, very specifically right before the hearts come, uh, there's a flavor I refer to as baby sick. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this too. Yeah, I've got a, a when I was first learning to cut off this still that we have here, I had a newborn. So, so that's just it's very personal in your brain. To me. Yes, <laughs> uh, my brother who doesn't have any children refers to it more as rubber tire. Yeah, not so much a burning tire, but just kind of just rubber in and of itself. Yeah, we talked about this earlier on. I totally get the baby sick thing. It's not that like growing up throw up that's all sour and horrible. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of sweet milk. Yeah, baby throw up. Yep. Totally get that. It's, it's actually not a lot of heads, is there? Not a whole lot. Yeah. No. This was a really clean fermentation though. We discovered that with the, the tails uh, on the, the stripping run. We realized true. there wasn't a lot of anything, but yeah. Um, Even the low ones tasted a little bit cleaner than what we typically get. So, yeah. 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 So after that, the sweetness is gonna change on it. Okay. So it goes from that kind of overly sick, when we start talking about the like, milky baby, it's still kind of sweet, but it's right. uh, not the sweetness we're really looking for. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so the fruit will come in pretty much at the beginning with, with some sweetness to it. That's really the change we're looking for. Okay. Um, as, as soon as there's kind of a, something that's almost, I call it mildewy. It's, a, it's very tactile. You can feel it on your teeth kind of. Uh, right. Once that's gone, okay. that's when I like to cut over to, to hearts. I assume it's the estuary stuff coming from the, the yeast at that point? It's those fruits? Yes, and so um, we, we notice that when we start switching our yeast. So sometimes uh, we'll use M1, sometimes we'll use a USW6, which is an American whiskey yeast. And the M1 tends to be a lot fruitier, more kind of in the grapey realm. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and you definitely taste that at the, at the beginning of hearts uh, when it starts coming through. What's happening when you start getting near the end of hearts? By the way, guys, this is a heart. <laughs> yeah, so kind of call it the first part of hearts right. and the second part of hearts. Um, and this is a good delineation because this one has most of those flavors we were just talking about. This changes a lot. So okay. whereas this this bottom part's going to have a lot of the mouthfeel to it, that's where you're going to kind of have the few soil interactions. This is stuff if you're going to barrel age it, you definitely want to include. Right. Um, but it starts going into a pruny kind of note. For, and almost all of our mash bills will finish this way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'll go into a pruny note and it kind of gets sweet. Yeah. Um, but then it also will eventually go down into more of a minty, kind of a more Italian basil kind of, okay. almost slightly vegetal, but still fairly minty on it. So we've cut for maturation. This is pretty, pretty similar to what you would cut? Almost exactly how we would do it, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and you're aiming for what, two to four years in Texas heat, yeah. new oak. Okay. Uh, if we were going to make this, whatever you want to call it, white spirit, moonshine, so on and so forth, what would be the point where you would say no more? Probably where that mint kind of okay. starts coming in. Okay. Um, it doesn't always sit as well as a, as a white spirit. So a little bit of mintiness in the back when you're tasting something is kind of refreshing sometimes. Yeah. This is like uh, too much mint. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is like somebody dropped dropped a little bit of gum into okay. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's very overpowering. Um, it does change once it hits the barrel. Uh, so we're not afraid of it for maturation purposes, okay. but in a clear spirit, you're going to lose a lot of this fruit. Uh, all right. Any tips on uh, maturation? I mean, uh, that's like another four hour talk, isn't it? But you got to have good wood. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, some of the bourbon producers will talk about how 80% of the flavor is comes from the wood. I don't know how I, I feel about that. I have no idea how you would even calculate that. No. <laughs> um, 
I'll, I can tell you a lot of the flavor comes from yeah. the wood. Yeah. And a lot of it comes from what it's removing from the spirit as well. Yeah. Um, so that's why that char layer on bourbon is usually really important. Um, char itself doesn't really have any flavor. Yeah, right. um, you, can, you can have like some wisp of smoke that's still kind of trapped in there. You can have the caramelized layer next to it, but char itself doesn't have any flavor. So you got to make sure you got to have good wood because all those flavors you're going to pull out into there um, are going to dominate a lot of what you got over here. Well, thanks, man. This yeah. has been an absolute blast, dude. No problem, man. Um, I thoroughly appreciate it. Uh, I know this has been a bit of a curveball for you. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought doing a gallon is harder than doing? A full-size production. It, it was a nah. logistical, uh, interesting for me to have to figure out uh, <laughs> how to make that all happen. So it was, it was a good time, though. It was awesome. So a huge thank you to the entire team at Iron Root for being so welcoming and generous with your time. An extra thanks to Jonathan for being so open and helpful. We really appreciate it, dude. And remember, everyone watching at home, no joke, no smoke. You really do need to get a hold of a bottle of Iron Root. Of course, I also need to say a thanks to the Patreons as well. Thanks for being the people that support the channel day in, day out. You're the reason that I can make trips and videos like this. So if you enjoyed the video, do all the YouTube things. Like, comment, sub up, and I'll catch you next time. See ya.